Once again, I greet you, my beloved, to this message on spiritual health and hygiene. I don't need to remind you that we've just lived through two very difficult years of a COVID-19 pandemic, during which we were forced of a necessity to practice very rigorous sanitation and hygiene protocols. We were taught to wash our hands and faces frequently and to wear masks in order to prevent us from contracting this highly contagious virus. I'm sure you all remember these things. Actually, I still wear the mask in public places to this day. And many of those who disregarded these precautions contracted this devastating illness. So, what is hygiene? It's a set of practices performed to stay healthy. And there are two levels of hygiene, group and personal. In today's discussion, I'll be emphasizing personal hygiene. We all would like to live healthy and productive lives. And if you're married and you have children, the last thing you want is to contract or even die of a serious illness that leaves your children and spouse without a loving parent. Of course, many serious or fatal diseases can be prevented with good hygiene, which involves keeping every part of our bodies clean and healthy. Our external hygiene is important because many harmful pathogens like bacteria and viruses cover our bodies. And if they're not removed, they can get inside of us and cause all kinds of troublesome diseases. So we're taught to use soap and alcohol solutions to decontaminate our bodies in order to maintain physical as well as mental health. Those of us who have computers know very well that if a virus infects our computer, it can wreak havoc on the precious files that we have stored inside of it. With all the spyware, phishing, and ransomware that are flooding cyberspace, the authorities are now talking about the necessity of cyber hygiene. That's why we pay thousands of dollars for antiviral software to keep them uninfected. One of the greatest achievements of modern medicine has been the emphasis of sanitation and hygiene in our hospitals and in our homes. None of us would want to go into a hospital where the rooms were unwashed and filthy and where they don't use meticulously sterilized instruments during surgery. They very rightly say that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Another anonymous microbiologist said, Half of the secret to disease resistance is cleanliness. The other half is dirtiness. Of course, regular hand washing is one of the best ways to prevent the spread of disease because we're constantly touching contaminated objects. And while we're busily sanitizing our external bodies, our built-in immune system is perpetually sanitizing our insides with a massive arsenal of antibodies, leukocytes, cytokines, and natural killer cells. It's constantly doing our house cleaning from the inside. And if we didn't have this God-given immune system, it would spell the end of our existence as a species. I mean, the air I'm breathing right now is actually raining constantly bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And I'm not afraid of breathing in these microorganisms because I know that my immune system is going to neutralize them once they enter into my body. But a very interesting fact about the human immune system is that it's not evolving. In fact, it's getting weaker and weaker throughout the historical timeline. That's why we need to help our immune systems by constantly washing and sterilizing and getting vaccinated so that our natural defenses don't get overwhelmed by this dangerous assault of lethal pathogens all around us. And besides all the physical benefits of healthy hygiene, it should be noted that people will tend to avoid a person who does not practice proper hygiene. And that can lead to their becoming isolated and lonely. Developing good hygiene in your children has to start when they're young. Good health and hygiene practices will move them toward a life of order and responsibility. And God's Word tells us that we need to discipline and educate them. It says, Fathers are to raise their children in the instruction and training of the Lord. 
In fact, the transgression of biblical laws of cleanliness and hygiene is one of the greatest sources of disease in our world today. Order and cleanliness are commands that came to us from heaven. Even way back in the Old Testament, God showed the Israelites that he wanted them to be clean. In chapter 19 of the book of Exodus, we see that God proposed a meeting with the people of Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Also, God himself taught Israel that their human waste had to be buried outside of the camp. Because what they didn't know back then was that human waste contains all kinds of disease-causing pathogens. So even back in the Old Testament thousands of years ago, the statement that cleanliness is next to godliness was already a well-known fact. Moses was way ahead of his time when he wrote down the health laws dictated to him by God, thousands of years before they were discovered by doctors and scientists. And New Testament Christianity has always placed a strong emphasis on personal health and hygiene. In fact, God's Word tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And in order to keep God's temple habitable, not only our bodies have to be kept clean and holy, but also our hearts and minds. King Solomon says in his Proverbs, My son, above all, Guard your heart, for out of it come the issues of life. What God's Word is saying here is that we should guard our hearts from going astray. He's not talking about the physical heart that pumps the blood through the arteries to every part of our body. He means our mental constitution, our character, from which come our good and evil deeds. In his letter to the Romans, Paul warns us, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves and your members unto God as those that are alive from the dead, as instruments of righteousness unto God. For as you have once yielded your members slaves to uncleanness and iniquity, even so now yield your members slaves to righteousness unto holiness." We didn't get saved just to avoid going to hell, but to enter into a glorious heaven where no unclean thing will enter. Paul also said to the Thessalonian Christians, For this is the will of God, that is, your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication and sin. For God has not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. The words sanctification and holiness are used interchangeably throughout the New Testament. So when we fail in our Christian lives to practice sound spiritual hygiene, we tend to live at a much lower level than what God has designed for us. The highest standard for Christ's children is to reflect Jesus himself. There is nothing higher. We're called to fight for purity and righteousness when all around us we see that Christians are caving in to the pressures of the world. But Paul said to the Philippian church, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We have to strive, that implies substantial effort, for the higher calling of God in Christ Jesus. So physical hygiene and computer hygiene are tedious enough. Why should we also have to add spiritual hygiene to our worries? If you ask the average Christian what the meaning of Christianity is, the first thing they'll say is forgiveness. To them, that's all that Christianity is about. They stop at forgiveness and don't go anywhere beyond that. And preachers love to say that Christianity is all about forgiveness. And it is, but unfortunately, that's where too many preachers stop. And so what the congregation takes away from the sermon is an unbalanced message. Because the sermons omit the fact that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have to grow, develop, and mature into the image of Jesus Christ.
And that process of development involves spiritual hygiene because God expects his children to live clean and pure lives. That doesn't just mean, as they say, a healthy mind in a healthy body. That would mean that we should all run to the gym and work hard there to perfect our bodies. And physical exercise has its place in today's sedentary lifestyle. But God's Word teaches us that the reverse is even more important. That is, a healthy body in a healthy mind. Jesus Christ himself said, the eye is the light of the body. So if your body's light is darkness, how much more dark will your body be if the light that lights your body is darkness? But there's one very powerful being in this universe that loves darkness and loves to see the human race in darkness. He knows very well how to exploit our human weaknesses, which are curiosity, self-pleasure, and the desire for power. That's why we see so much filth and false information in our world today. Think about it. Is our world becoming a better place to live in? It certainly is not. Our world is changing in the wrong direction, and it's changing far too quickly. Our world today is not what it was just two years ago. And the COVID epidemic is child's play in comparison to the postmodern epidemic of false information and false morality. You could call it an infodemic, an epidemic of misinformation. And as Christians, we need to be well immunized against these spiritual pathogens by controlling and regulating what our minds are consuming. God's Word tells us, Above all, my son, keep your heart diligently, for out of it come the issues of life. Our heart symbolizes the center of our innermost being, and it includes our conscious and unconscious minds. And for the purposes of this discussion, I'll consider the heart and the mind one and the same. Of course, we all try to keep our physical hearts healthy and clear of plaque-forming cholesterol, which clogs our arteries and can lead to heart attacks. But Christ talks about keeping our other heart clean, our innermost consciousness, our minds. The religious leaders of Israel, the Pharisees, were hygiene fanatics in the outward sense. But inwardly, their hearts were filthy. They had complete disregard for the hygiene of the heart, which is the most important thing to the child of God. Listen to what he says to those outwardly clean Pharisees. Woe to you Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the dish, but the inside is full of greed and extortion. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Here the Lord is not just talking about pots and pans. He's talking to people about cleaning up their hearts. Further, he says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. That means, as children of God, we should be extra vigilant in keeping our hearts clean by scrutinizing and controlling not just what goes into our stomachs, but most importantly, what goes into our hearts. And all the information we collect from the world around us come through the portals of the eyes and the ears. So what we hear is important, and what we see is important. What we read is important. That would include what internet sites we visit. They must all be scrutinized in the light of God's Word. Because if what we hear and see is garbage, all of that is being archived permanently in our minds. The late Vernon McGee said, What is hidden deep in the well of the heart will eventually come out through the bucket of the mouth. So let's be careful about keeping an open mind because that's a welcome sign for all kinds of filth and false doctrine to enter into our hearts and stay there. Satan knows that his time is short 
and that his freedom to destroy people is coming to an end very soon. So he's sending all kinds of unclean spirits out there to infect our minds and therefore our hearts with their unclean ideas. He knows there's a sucker born every minute. That's why we should be very careful about receiving the propaganda of this world. But someone may say, Stop the fear-mongering, Paul. I'm a Calvinist, and he taught that once saved, always saved. I am eternally secure. Well, then I ask you, do you recall the story of Demas? You see, for a very long time, he was a true and faithful assistant to the Apostle Paul, who was not easily fooled by anyone. At the end of his letter to the Colossian church, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Then he also writes to Philemon, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow laborers, greet you. So we see that Demas was in the Lord while he remained with Paul. But then something tragic happened to him, because in 2 Timothy 4.10, he wasn't with him anymore, and he has to plead for Timothy to come and help him. He writes to Timothy, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So we see at one time, Demas was a legitimate minister of the gospel. But he must have stopped controlling what he saw and heard from the culture of the world around him. And consequently, he let down his spiritual guard and became separated from the love of God. This proves that we have free moral agency even after conversion. And that means we can choose to backslide and fall from the grace of God. And my friend, that means your soul can get infected by the diseases of the world too. So above all, keep your heart diligently for out of it come the issues of life. The famous Christian author C.S. Lewis wrote, The contemporary propaganda for lust makes us feel that the desires we are resisting are so natural and healthy and so reasonable that it's almost perverse and abnormal to resist them. Poster after poster, film after film, novel after novel, and we should add website after website are associating the idea of sexual indulgence with the ideas of health, normality, openness, and good humor. Now this association is a lie. Surrender to all of our desires obviously leads to impotence, disease, jealousies, and lies. These things are the opposite of health, openness, and good humor. In order to be happy in this world, civilized man must have some sort of principles by which he chooses to reject some and to permit others. One man does this on Christian principles, another on hygienic principles, another on sociological principles. But natural desire will have to be controlled unless you're going to ruin your whole life. One of the greatest things learned from the COVID pandemic is the power of misinformation. The authorities recognized that there was another kind of epidemic going on. They called it an infodemic, an epidemic of misinformation. And just as medical misinformation can send you to an early grave, spiritual misinformation can give you a false sense of security in this life and send you to a place of unimaginable torment in the life to come. Christ said, Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy us. And he warned us that in the last days in which we're living right now, there will come perilous times, for people will hate one another. Just take a look around you and you'll see it. And many false preachers will arise and deceive many, and because iniquity will increase, the love of many will grow cold. So Satan knows his time is almost up. That's why we see through the mass media, social media, the education system, he's bombarding us with lies. The pathology of the spiritual world is much worse than a physical pandemic, because an infodemic attacks the Christian at the psychological level 
and can completely change his or her moral values. Once you're infected, you'll start doing things which are explicitly prohibited in God's Word. One of the biggest lies is that we're not under the law, we're under grace. So that means there's nothing we cannot do. God will no longer judge us for anything. Today's false apostles are teaching that God is some kind of hippie that is a timid old softy who would never condemn anyone. They say God is morally neutral. They teach that grace means that there's no more law. We're free and we can act with impunity. But God's Word tells us that grace does not mean license. Again, Paul says, You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to satisfy the desires of the flesh. These are the deeds of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There it is in black and white, my friends. Paul says, yes, we're free, we're under grace. But we mustn't use this freedom to satisfy the lusts of the flesh. He says that the wages of sin is still death. Of course, our postmodern apostles are all saying that the first apostles got it all wrong. They've received a new revelation, a super revelation, that promises a lifetime of partying and prosperity. They're promulgating the lie that in Christianity there is no cross to bear, that we don't need to live righteously. Christ is our righteousness. Well, if that's the case, why does the Holy Spirit say in the book of Revelation, Let us rejoice and be glad, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride, that is the church, has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her. The fine linen stands for the righteousness of the saints. So we start our Christian walk with Christ's righteousness. But in a day-by-day -day sense, we have to work out our own righteousness by living cleanly. And Christ also had very harsh words to the church in Sardis. He tells them, I know your deeds. You bear my name as if you were alive, but you are dead. So the whole group of Christians there was dead. But listen to what the Lord says next. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. So my friend, I say to you, never just follow the herd or the group you belong to. Filter everything through God's word. Walk worthy of Christ and keep your clothes clean. So the hygienic Christian life is a sanctified Christian life. In order to be spiritually clean, we need to sanitize our hearts and minds from all external filth. That's exactly what Christ is saying when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Also, James, the Lord's brother, says, True religion before God is to look after the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep ourselves unpolluted by the world. But how do we keep our hearts unpolluted by the world we live in? We're literally bombarded by the world from every angle, from the radio, from our computers and our iPhones, from our friends and peers. Should we go and live in a cave somewhere in order to separate ourselves far away from the filth and the dirt that the world bombards us with? Neither Christ nor his apostles ever taught Christians to do such a thing. What they taught is this. Present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
This is the only trance that God allows His children. That is the transformation of our minds from carnal thinking to spiritual thinking. This is the only way that we can become fully victorious and mature Christians. And this transformation of our minds is what protects us from cultural contamination. Becoming a new creature is what prevents us from caving into the social pressures to have a bit of fun. This world calls us to fornication, whereas God calls us to sanctification. And that, my beloved, means self-discipline by establishing very clear and definite internal boundaries in our hearts. As I've already pointed out, the evil deeds that separate us from God originate in our hearts. That is, they originate in our thought life. The greatest victories and defeats in this world take place in the battlefield of the mind. And King Solomon was so right when he said, Above all things, diligently guard your heart. And King David, Solomon's father, prayed, Lord, create in me a pure heart. In another psalm, he says, And if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. King David never forgot what happened to him when he ceased to guard his heart diligently. We all know very well about the grief that his sin brought to himself and his entire family after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. That all resulted from a lack of discipline in his own thought life. A healthy heart comes not just through exercise and a diet low in saturated fats, but by maintaining a clean and healthy mind through intense self-awareness and self-examination. I don't mean self-awareness in the way that the Eastern mystics prescribe it when they say, go inside yourself. No, I mean examining every thought and evaluating it in the light of God's Word. And if that thought or information from the outside world violates God's Word, you need to place a boundary between it and yourself. I'm sure you all know that we have five senses. They are sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. These are the portals through which we receive all the information that comes to us about the world around us. And since about 80% of the information that enters our minds comes through our eyes, this is the portal that I'll be discussing the most here. Everything our eyes see gets permanently burnt into our minds as short-term or long-term memory. That's why Christ told us that our eyes have the most power to brighten or darken our body and our soul. So we should avoid viewing anything unclean, because these images are conveyed to our hearts, where our innermost being, our character, resides. And that is where we determine to act upon what we see. I've realized that not by studying other people, but by studying myself. I am certainly no saint, but I've learned to use visual censorship when it comes to what enters into my heart through my eyes. And as a result of this censorship, sin has no dominion over me. You see, my friends, whatever captures your eyes can very easily capture your heart. And above all things, my son, guard your heart diligently. So the true and victorious child of God prevents his eyes from viewing things like pornography and video games with sexually suggestive and violent scenes. Just take a look at how many prominent people in positions of authority have ruined their lives as a result of their immoral and undisciplined sexual behavior. By abandoning visual hygiene, these leaders allowed their hearts to become polluted. And that led to the snowball effect, ultimately ruining their careers, their marriages, and their lives. There's always a very high price to pay when we disregard the sexual boundaries given to us by God. And that price is too high in this age and in the age to come. But as regenerate Christians, we must not allow 
any sin to have dominion over us. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. That's how we get our dopamine rush, by living a wholesome, pure, and clean life. This does take a great deal of self-discipline, but we should also look away from women who are dressed immodestly. And women, you'll do a great deal to help us by dressing in a way that doesn't attract people's attention to your body. It's an unfortunate reality today that men, and especially women, have been programmed by the fashion industry to believe that if you've got it, flaunt it. But let's walk worthy of God. And he tells us, let your modesty be known to all people. Get this now. Not your beauty, not your intelligence, not your eloquence, but your modesty, your moderation. So the child of God should flee all youthful lusts. We should avoid all unbiblical sexual behavior. Of course, if you're single and living a sanctified life, people are going to say things about you. As a child of God, you'll just have to get used to that. Now, the other significant portal into our hearts is through our ears. What voices do we listen to? What kind of music do we listen to? My friends, we need to screen and censor whatever enters into our hearing as well. Because much of what enters into our ears is not the truth. And if we're not on our guard, we can allow our hearts to become contaminated by unclean ideas. That's why we need to be critical of the voices speaking to us from the world around us. We need to train our hearing to be able to distinguish whether the voice we hear is that of a wolf or of a shepherd. Here, I'd like to tell you about something that happened to me in my teenage years. I'd often go fishing on a causeway close to where we lived. And one day I took my younger brother with me to hunt for some crabs, which I liked to use for bait whenever I went fishing. The bream, which I loved to catch, loved crabs. So we searched under the rocks in the causeway, which was where the little crabs usually were, and we couldn't find a single crab. We looked under a lot of rocks, but we never saw one crab, because the tide was too high. But we were hopeful and kept on turning over rocks here and there, and then suddenly a man came down and joined us and asked us what we were doing, and we told him that we were looking for crabs for fishing bait. We also told him that we weren't being very successful. He seemed like a nice person, and he told us, well, I know a place that's just a few hundred yards away from here that has all kinds of lagoons. You'll find all kinds of crabs there. Why don't you come and join me? I declined, but he kept on pressing. He said, I'm actually going over there right now. You fellows just follow me. But by that time, an alarm bell had gone off in my head. You see, I knew about the place he was talking about. I had gone fishing there quite often, and I knew that there were no lagoons there. There were no lagoons there, and there certainly were no crabs. I said, Dave, I don't like the sound of this guy. Let's take our bikes and head home right now. So we climbed up the levee, got on our bikes, and made a beeline for home. But as we were riding home, I saw something. I saw that man jump out from a pile of dirt with a large stick in his hand, bigger than a baseball bat. And the look on his face was that of hatred and evil. We were very fortunate to go home that day, but I never told my parents anything about that incident, because if I did, they would never have let me go fishing again. But thanks to that God-given critical voice inside me, it very likely saved our lives that day. And a child of God in the same way has to develop that internal critical faculty by which we can test all things, holding fast to that which is good. And that critical faculty came in very useful to me later in my life. You see, many years later, I became a member of a church in which a serious rift had occurred over the formation of a parachurch group that is, a group that wanted to work outside of the main church's control and regulation. This group wanted to operate from the church, but totally independent of it. They wanted to remain members of the main church and receive financial aid from its members, 
but they didn't want to give any account whatsoever to the church. Basically, it was a little cult that was forming within the church, and I refused to join it. And later, I was at a prayer meeting, and there was a voice that spoke to me. A woman who claimed to be a prophet came up to me and uttered a prophecy. My son Paul, I command you to join that other group, and then I will pour my blessings upon you. Fortunately, by that time, I was maturing as a Christian, and I knew how to distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit from the voice of the devil. So something about that voice didn't sit right with me. And the other voice, which was the voice of the Holy Spirit, told me, you will know them by their fruits. And I knew this person's fruits. For one thing, I knew that she used her fake gift of prophecy for the purposes of control, manipulation, and deception, so that everywhere she went, she created division and discord. And I was also aware of the fact that the leader of that splinter group was her son, who, although he was a great self-promoter, was somehow always shifty and disingenuine. And so the Holy Spirit showed me that something was seriously wrong there. And it was very clear to me, and it was clear to the church leaders, that these people were not living a hygienic Christian life. And I warned the church leaders that they were being complicit in the potential breakup of that church. There were two sides waging war against one another, and we were caught in the crossfire. And the church breakup did take place shortly after we left. You see, the problem with both sides was that outwardly they gave the impression that they were doing God's work, but they were only doing it superficially. And like the Pharisees in Christ's time, they were not in love with God at all, but they were in love with their little system, and they didn't want anyone to rock the system, even though the system was wrong. Both sides just wanted to have the stage to themselves. They were lovers of themselves and not lovers of God, having an outward form of godliness, but denying its power. And finally, I'd like to say something on the subject of unhygienic music. We human beings simply cannot live without music, and evolutionary biologists have no plausible explanation for that. And yet, music-making defines the human species. It's so essential that it's been called the universal language. And similar to the food we eat, it can either be healthy for us, or it can be very harmful. That's because there are so many different forms of music and most of them do not glorify God. Listening to rock, including Christian rock and contemporary Christian worship, adds a layer of unsanitary filth on the listener's heart. The term Christian rock is an oxymoron. Those two words contradict each other because rock and roll went hand in hand with the sexual revolution. And both of those cultures were and still are very hostile to Christianity. It stands for rebellion and irreverence. And yet it now plays a dominant role in rogue churches everywhere. Drums were never a part of the early church culture, and neither should they ever be a part of modern church culture. There as well, we have to be careful about which voices we listen to. Is that clean music, or is it filth from the outside world? In the book of the prophet Ezekiel, God severely reprimanded and punished the religious leaders of Israel. Here's why. For teaching that there was no difference between clean and unclean. I remember a doctor of theology who was very popular among the Russian youth. At a youth conference, he was asked, What do you think of the idea of having drums in a church worship service? He said, I don't see anything wrong with it. After all, King Solomon had 200 drums at the opening of the temple. Now, I only have a science degree, not a degree in theology. But most importantly of all, I have a Bible. And I searched high and low to find out how many drums King Solomon had at the opening of the temple. And I did not find any mention of drums anywhere. There were no drums at the temple. But I did find that there were drums in the Valley of Tophet, that is, the Valley of Drums. Tophet stands for drums. 
that was basically the garbage dump for the city of Jerusalem. And it was there that reprobate and rebellious Israelites worshipped the pagan idol of Molech. They brought sacrifices to him on a bronze statue of a bull with outstretched hands. And inside of that idol, they would light a fire to make that idol red hot. And then they would take their children and put them on the red hot arms of that idol. And as they screamed and burned, the musicians would pound on the drums so loud so that the foolish parents would not hear the desperate screams of their dying child. That all took place in the valley of Tophet. It was a garbage dump. It was definitely unhygienic physically and spiritually. What instruments did the church have? They had strings, woodwinds, brass, trumpets, and the human voice. So drums never had any place in the worship of Jehovah or Jesus Christ. That's another example of how our hearts can get polluted via our ears. We should tune our ears to God's word so that we can distinguish between the right voices and the wrong voices. Every Christian wants to be of some use to God. If that's not your primary objective in life, you are not a Christian. And the Apostle Paul wrote about this to his protege, Timothy. He writes, In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, and some for honorable purposes, and others for dishonorable. If a man makes himself clean of these things, he will be a vessel for honorable purposes, sanctified and useful to the master. Here again, we're faced with the words clean and sanctified, and they're linked only to vessels for honorable purposes. What Paul is saying here is that unless we've purged ourselves of backslidings, false doctrines, worldliness, and dishonorable behavior, God will not be able to use us for honorable purposes. God wants us to be spiritually pure, and that involves living a clean life, a holy life not a holier-than-thou life. But how can we be morally clean when we live in a culture that actively propagandizes idolatry and paganism? Our world is changing quickly, my friends, and in the wrong direction. Science and technology are advancing in leaps and bounds. They've mapped the human genome, and artificial intelligence is about to make us humans obsolete. There's a surge in the growth of New Age and the occult. Global climate is changing, and major food sources like the oceans are being depleted. On land, our farms are being ravaged by droughts, floods, and erosion. We're now seeing the first signs of food insecurity, rampant divorce, the breakdown of the family unit, inflation, superbugs, gender confusion, media brainwashing, and universal electronic surveillance. Cultural norms and morality are changing and they're changing fast. You could call what's happening a moral genocide, a genocide of conscience. Before our very eyes, we see in this world a growing hostility to Christians and Christianity. In fact, the greenhouse gas curve should be called the immorality curve. But let's not get discouraged by focusing on the immorality of others. Is it even possible anymore for us to be elevated to the status of a vessel of God for a higher, more honorable purpose when we're surrounded by filth on all sides? So should we give up on the hygienic Christian life and adopt this new morality just to keep up with the times? What do we do? Refuse vaccinations? Stock up on firearms? And go and live in fortified underground bunkers? Let's read what God's Word tells us to do when there's a seismic shift in a nation's moral values. Let's see what some biblical men of faith did when they found themselves in the same dangerous situation. In the book of Daniel, we read that after the kingdom of Judah was destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, all but a very few of the Jews were taken far away from their Jewish homeland as captives to Babylon. 
and the very best of them were taken to serve as servants in the royal court. Among them were Daniel and three other young Jews who were subjected to horrific tortures if they dared to resist the king's forced assimilation into pagan Babylonian culture. And to complete this cultural genocide, even their names were changed in honor of Babylonian gods. Even now we refer to Daniel's friends by their pagan names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So everything short of a lobotomy was done in order to convert them to paganism. You see, the country and the temple where they worshipped Jehovah for almost a thousand years were completely destroyed. Their holy city, Jerusalem, had been razed to the ground so that there was nothing for them to go back to. But that temple was at the center of the Judaic faith, and it no longer existed. It would have seemed that the entire Jewish faith was destroyed with that temple. Without the sacred city, Jerusalem, and the temple of Jehovah, did they have any reason to remain faithful to God anymore? Talk about living in a changed world. Their world had been completely obliterated. What was left for them to do? Should they conform? After all, they were captives and slaves now. So if a Babylonian says jump, they're supposed to say how high. Now let's read about how these young Jewish exiles responded to this cultural change toward idolatry and paganism. In Daniel chapter 1, we read that the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Many people use this passage as an argument for vegetarianism, but their premise is totally false. You see, they refuse to make themselves ceremonially unclean or defiled by accidentally eating anything unclean according to the laws of Leviticus. That's what was required for anyone to live a hygienic Christian life under the law of Moses. They could not eat pork, camel, rabbit, or ostrich meat. So what was the result of their abstinence? We read, At the end of ten days they looked healthier and better nourished than all those who ate of the king's food. Then they were tested again when the king pressured them to conform to Babylonian idolatry. This time Nebuchadnezzar demanded that every official in his empire bow down and worship a gigantic 125-foot golden idol he had constructed. And the punishment for anyone who refused to bow down was that they would be thrown into a blazing furnace. And again, we see that they did not cave into idolatry, but remained faithful to Jehovah God. While everyone bowed down in awe of this giant golden image, they remained standing. But the evil they were threatened with did come upon them. We read, Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said to them, If you do not worship my idol, you will be thrown immediately into the fiery furnace. Then what God will rescue you? And after they continued to refuse, Nebuchadnezzar had them thrown into the furnace. But instead of seeing them go up in a puff of smoke, Nebuchadnezzar was shocked to see them walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. So after the king asked them to come out, he and all his officials saw that they were completely untouched by the fire. And the king's attitude was changed toward them, and he promoted them within his empire. You see, beloved, because they had cleansed themselves from all this paganism, God was able to use them for honorable purposes. It wasn't really Nebuchadnezzar who promoted them. It was God. Then much later we read that Daniel was tested again under another king, Darius, and another empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. This time a group of high-ranking and powerful enemies undertook to destroy him. They did this by tricking King Darius into signing an edict that forbade anyone from praying to anyone but the king himself. The penalty for disobeying this edict was that the person would be thrown into a den of hungry lions. Of course, this edict was aimed at destroying Daniel, because he interfered with their corrupt activities. 
They did not like Daniel's clean lifestyle, and so they decided to get rid of him. They knew very well that Daniel was a man of prayer, and therefore they also knew that he would not obey this edict. And just as they expected, Daniel disregarded the king's edict and continued to pray three times a day before an open window. Daniel continued to pray because he knew that's where his strength came from. So he disregarded the king's edict, not out of disrespect, but he regarded God's authority surpassing all earthly authority. Here again we see Daniel resolving not to defile himself by praying to man as if man was God. God was his supreme authority. And let me say here that there is nothing Satan fears more than a praying Christian. So when his enemies reported to the king that Daniel had violated his edict, he had to be thrown into the lion's den. And we see that Daniel spent a beautiful night among those lions, because God made them as tame as pussycats. But when his enemies were thrown to the same lions, they were immediately torn into pieces before they could even hit the ground. Now, summarizing, let's just look at the strong faith and resolve of those four young Jews in the face of mortal adversity from a very advanced but also very idolatrous culture, just like the one you and I are living in right now. They believed that any law that contravened God's law was null and void. And if that offends you, that's your problem, not ours. And because of their faithfulness, they had enemies. And you will too. Charles Spurgeon says, Let's always remember that we're living in the enemy's territory. We're strangers and sojourners. This world is not our friend. If the world is your friend, then you are not a friend of God. He who is a friend of the world and its idolatrous culture is the enemy of God. Be assured that as a Christian, you will find enemies everywhere. When you sleep, contemplate that you're resting on the battlefield. When you go for a walk, you should expect an ambush behind every hedge. Now, he's not telling us to be paranoid, but to be vigilant. Today, we live in a world that worships technological progress. And I am no Luddite. I have a computer and I have the internet. But the Lord has taught me to be the master of the technology and not to allow the technology to be my master. I think it's okay to have the internet. There's a lot of good material there. But it's not okay for using it for pornography, online gambling, or cybercrime. God says, be holy for I am holy. And that's not the Old Testament. That's the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1. When it comes to living the hygienic Christian life, we cannot just let go and let God. We have to take the initiative ourselves. We ourselves have to be brave and steadfast. Our hearts have to be fixed on God. We have to resolve to be holy and undefiled. We have to adopt a whole new and clean lifestyle. We have to decide ourselves, come what may, to pay the price and stand up for God. We have to resolve ourselves not to consume anything that may defile our body and soul. Let's be prepared to suffer the consequences of staying clean. Daniel's friend said, King Nebuchadnezzar, even if God does not deliver us, we will still not bow down to your golden idol. And God's word says through Isaiah, You will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. I know Western Christianity is completely averse to suffering. It preaches success and prosperity. And many so-called spiritual leaders today call those who suffer for God's truth losers. Whereas on the other hand, they would sell God's truth for any price. Jesus Christ himself said that the penalty for being faithful to him will be persecution and ostracism. Your friends and family may discard you, your church may excommunicate you, and your employer may fire you. You will be called a loser, maybe even a criminal, 
But don't be afraid of that. There is no money or worldly glory in Christianity. But there is a cross that leads to an abundant life full of joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. When you suffer, you'll be rewarded with a much closer walk with Jesus and much more joy. Yes, you may end up being thrown into the lion's den, but like Daniel, you'll come out without a scratch. It's worth the battle, because the reward is a crown of glory in heaven. We know that Christ doesn't change over the ages. When times are harder, His grace and mercy will still be available, and He will see you and me through the difficult times. It's all worth it in the long run. The victory is ours, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their cry. And at times wickedness may prosper, but that's only in the short term. In the long term, righteousness always triumphs, because God answers the prayers of the righteous. So let's choose to walk with Jesus. Let's walk in the Spirit. That will give us a new vitality and a more abundant life. Only when we're with Christ is life worth living. And only then do we begin to live in the real sense. And then God will be able to use us as vessels for honorable purposes. So, beloved, sanctify yourselves, for God will be doing wonders among you tomorrow. Thank you for committing the time to watch this message. May God bless you richly in the meantime. Goodbye for now. Thank you.